Welcome to my cave. I'm continuing to walk through what's in my part box, and the sort of generic parts, jelly beans they're called, that you'll see on my channel. Last time I covered passive components, resistors, capacitors, inductors. This time I want to get into the transistors and the diodes, because substituting one type for another seems to mystify a lot of viewers. But nine times out of ten, the devices I call for will fall into one of only four categories. Back in the day, a Lector magazine used to print schematics that would replace the part numbers with one of four abbreviations. DUG, Diode Universal Germanium. DUS, Diode Universal Silicon. TUN, Transistor Universal NPN. And TUP, Transistor Universal PNP. They used these rather than part numbers for any one of a hundred or so different types will do. Germanium diodes are largely a thing of the past, but now Schottky diodes fill sort of the same niche and should probably be added to the list. But then I can't make nice, neat, unique acronyms. So I'll tip my hat to the editors of Elector magazine and continue putting in typical part numbers in my schematics. Starting with the diodes, the vast majority of the ones that I use can have fairly loose specs. A 40 volt reverse voltage gives plenty of margin for the 24 or 30 volt split supplies that I usually use in analog circuits. 100 milliamps of forward current is plenty. I like to hold the leakage current under a microamp so I don't have to worry that peak detectors, integrators, and the like will have their voltages droop. A quarter watt of power dissipation is what you can get in a package sized for a typical small diode. And I like to have the capacitance under 5 picofarads, particularly in radio circuits. Fortunately for me, all the popular diodes meet this spec. The classic 1N914, the 1N4148, which is often the exact same diode, and the BAV21 all fall in this category. And there are lots more that will serve. These are just the ones that my distributor stocks in hundreds of thousands, if not millions. On the Schottky side, the diodes will have a lower forward voltage and a much shorter recovery time. I don't care about leakage current quite as much. The classic 1N5711 is typical of the breed, although the 1N6263 and BAT41 appear to be this year's cheap Schottkys. Most of the current parts are also available in surface mount packages with the W suffix on the part number. I suppose I should also talk about some more specialized diodes. There are big beefy diodes that get used in power supplies, in motor drives, as freewheel diodes for inductive loads, that sort of thing. There's a big series of ones that can do an ampere of forward current. The 1N4001 series are standard silicon diodes, with reverse voltages ranging from 50 volts up to a kilovolt. If you need a little more, the 1N5401 series do 3 amperes, with reverse voltages up to 600 volts. The 1 amp parts have surface mount variants shown in the table. The 3 amp parts mostly don't, because their heavy gauge wire leads carry heat out of the part. You need to look at their data sheets to see how the manufacturers recommend managing the heat. Switching power supplies work at much higher frequencies than the 50 or 60 hertz of the power line. They need Schottky diodes. For small switchers, the 1N5819, a 1 amp part, and the 1N5822, a 3 amp part, are popular. You can get them much bigger than these. I've seen a listing for a dual Schottky diode that will handle 400 amperes at 45 volts, I have no idea what the intended application is for that brute. All of the power diodes switch slower, have more leakage, and more capacitance than their small signal counterparts, so we don't usually want them in the signal path. But I keep a few around in case I need to build a power supply for some oddball voltage. When I poked around in my junk box, I also found some obsolete diodes. Good heavens, did I really have 1N457s in there? and a few specialty ones. Among those were low leakage ones like the 1N3595 and PAD5. 
Those are great for things like peak detectors, because their leakage currents are tiny, down in the hundreds of femtoamperes. But I find that I don't often need them, as long as I'm working at a very low voltage. If I'm working below a reverse voltage of 5 volts or so, a BJT with the base and collector shorted together is a terrific low leakage part. Up to about 20 volts, a JFET with source and drain shorted is also a wonderful low leakage diode. So I typically need to resort to the specialty parts only if my signals might swing farther than that. A lot of other teachers suggest keeping around a kit of Zener diodes in a variety of voltages. I find these are great for voltage clamps, where they may need to move a lot of current. But most of the time I see Zeners in other people's projects, they're the voltage reference in a power supply or other reference circuits. And they're terrible at that. First off, you need to stock a whole bunch of different values. The low voltage ones, below 5 volts or so, have forward voltages that depend on the forward current, and the high voltage ones, past about 7 or 8 volts, put a ton of noise on their outputs. In fact, my video on noise generation uses the base of interjunction of a BJT functioning as a Zener diode. There may be a sweet spot with the 5.6 or 6.2 volt parts, but for the most part I consider Zeners to be more trouble than they're worth. I'd rather stock a small number of IC voltage references, like the TL431 or LM385, and use them as variable Zeners. I've got a video coming up on just that. I'll try to remember to put a card at the corner when that video drops. Okay, now moving on to transistors. Most of my designs use universal transistors just as they use universal diodes. A universal transistor will have at least the same 40 volt breakdown voltage to have a comfortable margin with 24 or 30 volt supplies. A TO92 package will be able to handle at least about 200 milliamps of collector current and dissipate about a quarter watt. Some of the surface mount ones are a little smaller, so I say universal one will handle 100 milliamps and 100 milliwatts. It should have a beta of at least 100 at small currents and be reasonably fast, 100 MHz transition frequency and no more than 5 picofarads of capacitance between collector and base. Once again, a whole raft of popular BJTs will fit all these non-demanding specs. I've grouped the part numbers here, with each row of the table giving a complementary pair that will run together gracefully in a circuit like a push-pull follower. Each cell of the table lists the through-hole part and then the surface mount equivalent. Nowadays, I happen to like the 2N4401 and 4403 because they're quieter than the others, a great thing to have for audio. But I expect that any of these will work in my circuits, unless I told you otherwise. If you're trying to substitute them into a circuit that has the layout already designed, be careful, because not all universal transistors have the same pinout. Make sure you've identified the leads correctly. I also went and looked through my junk box for what else might be lurking in there that's interesting. I've got some 2N5551 and 2N5401 transistors. I was tempted to group those under universal, but I keep them separate because they're a higher voltage part with a 150 volt breakdown voltage. I expect they'll work where I call for a universal transistor, but surely not the other way around. I also have some 2N5087s and 2N5089s. These are parts with a current gain of a few hundred. Sometimes you need that. But some of my circuits probably aren't stable with that high a gain and might start to oscillate unless I took steps to tame them, so those transistors aren't universal. The 2N5087 and 2N5089 are starting to show their age. For a new design, I'd probably go with something like BC549C and BC559C, which are mostly similar parts in more modern packages. Circuits like speaker amplifiers or motor drivers need a lot more power at their outputs, I keep a few power transistors on hand. Generally they're MJE3055 and 2955 for standard transistors, and it's convenient to have Darlington pairs in a single package, so TIP120 and TIP127 come in handy as well. There are lots of other parts that would serve. These are just the ones that I found, but they're really popular. 
A lot of the time nowadays, power MOSFETs will do a better job. But that's a whole other topic for another time. Once in a great while, I built something that needs to work at radio frequency. The 2N5179NPN is a classic for that. Its transition frequency is up in the gigahertz. It doesn't have a great PNP counterpart. PNPs struggle to keep up in high-performance applications. I also keep a handful of JFETs on hand, both as fast switches and as low-leakage diodes. JFET's performance numbers tend to be all over the map. It's hard for the manufacturers to make predictable ones. I try to design so that I don't much care. In most of my circuits that use JFETs, any old N-channel JFET will probably work. I seldom need P-channel ones. I also occasionally use a few small MOSFETs. For the N-channel ones, 2N7000 is pretty much the universal part. 2N7002 is the surface mount counterpart. Its switching threshold is 3 volts, which is compatible with 5 volt CMOS logic. It has 60 volt breakdown voltage, which is plenty for what I want to do with it. Its power handling is pretty typical for a TO92 part. The choice of a good P-channel counterpart is less clear, and I've found in the last few years that availability varies widely. So every time I order, it seems to be a different part. Right now, I have a few BS250Ps on hand. Their specs are right in line with what I'd expect in a TO92 package. As I said, power MOSFETs are another kettle of fish entirely. They come in all sorts of packages, threshold voltages, gate voltages, and power capabilities. I don't keep specific ones on hand, so I do best to discuss them as they come up in projects. So, in summary, the discrete parts that I like to keep on hand are a pot full of small diodes, both standard and shot key, a handful of power diodes, a whole lot of universal BJTs, a few power BJTs, and maybe Darlington's as well, a bunch of 2N7000 MOSFETs, a few P-channel MOSFETs of whatever type I can find this year, a few N-channel JFETs, type isn't that important, and whatever specialty parts I have left over from previous projects. That lets me design almost any of my circuits, while only having to order parts that are really specific to the project. I hope that answers most of the questions about discrete semiconductor substitution. Thanks to the viewer who suggested the topic, and thanks to everyone else for watching. If you liked this information, let the algorithm know with a thumbs up, and maybe favor me with a subscription. Next time in this little series, I'll get into what I'm using in the way of jelly bean op amps and comparators, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye!